Yo, 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 it's your girl and boy CT. I'm Cindy Barnes. And I'm Travis Barnes. And we are the founders of the Overcomers Podcast. Sponsored by Journey 333. That is a place of mind, body, spirit that helps you with fitness, coaching, and nutrition to look better, live better, and feel better. We produce these episodes every week for your enjoyment to help people to overcome adversity and live their dreams. Yo, 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 it's your girl and boy CT. I'm Travis Barnes. And I'm Cindy Barnes. And we're the founders of Journey 333 and the founders of the Overcomer Podcast that is sponsored by Journey 333. Now that's a lot of three, so let me tell you, it's fitness, coaching, and nutrition. We help people to look better, live better, and feel better. And it's mind, body, spirit. So today, we're going to be helping you get your mind right. I love the name of the guests that we're having on the show today. His name is Travis as well. That's right. Travis Chapel. He's the founder of Guestio that helps people get connected with guests for their podcasts and things such as that. He is also an entrepreneur. He is a mentor to those who want to start the podcast. They are, he is a presenter, a coach, an entrepreneur. He's just awesome. You know what? Let's just bring him on the show and get started. All right, here we go. Travis, thank you for coming on our show. What's up, Travis? What's going on, Cindy? How are you guys doing? So good. Thanks for being here. Happy to be here. Happy to be here. Awesome. Well, our show is about overcoming adversity. And Cindy, you know, we're talking about Travis's beginnings. He wasn't always Mr. Vegas, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. So that is where you're located now is Las Vegas. But let's start prior to that. Come from humble beginnings. Tell us a little bit about how you got started, maybe back in your childhood and stuff like that. Like, how'd you grow up? Sure. Yeah. So I grew up in Southern California. So about three and a half hours or so from where I live now um, in a city called Lancaster, uh, which if you don't know where that is, that would be Northern LA County. So we're technically still in LA County, but we're probably pretty much as far North as you could, as you could possibly get. Like one of the cities, the city directly North of us was outside of LA County. So we're exactly, exactly on the border of of LA County growing up. And so Lancaster was kind of a, you know, kind of a dead end type of a place. In terms of population, it wasn't a small town, but in terms of things to do, it was a small town. Um, So I actually grew up on this campus that was on the east side of town. Um, It was a large independent fundamental Baptist church community. And I say community because it was kind of a mega church in a sense. It's, you know, now I don't know how many members now, seven, 8,000 members maybe. And when we started going there back in like 1995, when I was um, just, you know, two years old, um, you know, there was, I don't know, maybe, maybe a thousand people that, that were going to church there. But um, but as it continued to evolve, they added a school onto the same campus and they added a college onto the same campus. And so I went to church there, but I also went to school there and I went to college there. So, you know, I graduated kindergarten, eighth grade, high school, college, and went to church, all my sports activities, everything and for that, you know, first 20 years of, of my life essentially was lived there in that one place in this kind of bubble. And uh, so when I was graduating college, you know, a college like that, we had less than a thousand students and uh, um, they were strictly ministerial degrees. So um, there was nothing quote unquote secular, as we would have said back then, um, that, that you could study there. There was no liberal arts. It was basically just ministry stuff. So I got my degree in double majored in Bible and church ministries. And by the time I graduated, I realized that that wasn't really what I wanted to be doing anymore. And uh, but I was, you know, already done with all of my requirements to graduate. So we graduated anyway, um, got married before graduated. So the schedule was like in December, um, finished, finished up classes a semester early. And then in January, got married and moved out of, um, obviously moved out of my parents' house, got an apartment with my wife. And then uh, May of that year, we walked and actually graduated, got our diplomas And then September, we moved away from Lancaster for the first time up to to Fresno. And that's really where I started to just get to know myself a little bit more, you know, and and whenever you grow up in a in a bubble like that, that uh, in the context where you only really have one perspective or worldview, um, I think that you owe it to yourself to get out and try to figure out who you are a little bit, because up to that point, you're basically just a combination of everybody else's thoughts and influence on, on your life, you know, for that period of time. So 
Um, I did the only thing I knew how to do at the time, which was door to door sales. Cause that's what I did in college to make a little bit extra money. So I knew that I didn't want to be a ministry, which was what I had a degree for. Um, and I, I say degree very lightly because, you know, first of all, it's a Bible degree, but second of all, it was an unaccredited Bible degree. So it was even more useless than a regular Bible degree. And you can't go really get a good job with a degree like that. I've never tried it. So, uh, the only, the, so my options were pretty limited at the time. It was basically like, Hey, go do something that'll pay me 25, 35 grand a year at a starter position somewhere and work my way up or do door to door sales, hundred percent commission and work 20 hour work weeks and shoot for six figures. And so I opted for the second one and, uh, uh, hit six figures that first year that I was full-time in door to door. And then after, uh, that year was done, I kind of looked back on it and had this moment of clarity around where I wanted to be in the future. And I looked at, you know, what, you know, this was, oh, this is okay for 23 year old Travis where, you know, making six figures, knocking doors. I was able to kind of make my own schedule. I worked in the afternoons. I didn't really do much in the mornings. I'd go to the gym, you know, if I wanted to, maybe not, if I didn't want to, you know, hung out on the weekends, had some fun, you know, it was a good type of like unplugging year. But by the end of it, I looked at 33 year old Travis and I was like, I don't think that guy wants to be knocking on doors anymore. So I should probably do something to switch the direction that I'm headed or else that's where I'm going to end up. And so I kind of stopped uh, knocking on doors pretty abruptly because I was just trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. And I was kind of doing the work of a 15 year old when I was 23, except now I had a wife and I had a mortgage and I had an electric bill and I had all these other things. So I couldn't just go like sleep on my mom's couch until I figured it out, you know? So um, I took a few months off essentially. Um, and my wife was working at the time uh, to help pay the bills and all that good stuff. And uh, I basically just dove into personal development for the first time in my life. Uh, the first time, it was the first time in my life that I ever seeked out knowledge outside of the bubble that I grew up in on purpose. Um, so anybody that knows me or knew me at that time uh, would have, would have, you know, fell over in their chair um, if they would have heard that I was reading a book, you know what I mean? Like, well, you're reading a book, you know, like, are, is, are you the same Travis, you know? So like doing that kind of stuff, I, I'm just saying that to emphasize how out of the norm that was for me. I wasn't just somebody just pick up a book and start reading it. I never went to bookstores. I never bought books, probably read maybe 10 books total in my whole life up to that point, um, including the ones that I was supposed to have read during school that right. I didn't read. And, uh, uh, so at that time I was just kind of chasing, you know, trying to, I was basically just trying to figure out what I was going to do. And, and it was a back against the wall moment. And that's why I was forced to move into those, into those discovery tools, because I was just like, I, I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing here. I don't know where I'm going to be. I don't know what I want to do. I don't know any of those things. I looked at everything guys. Like I looked at, I looked at FBI agent applications. I looked at, um, like fire department uh, uh, applications. I, I looked, man, there's so many different career paths that I considered at the time. I was applying for a bunch of different types of jobs, left and right, um, sales jobs for like corporate sales and stuff, because I figured, hey, I'm in door to door. I can translate some of that skill. Did, couldn't get hired anywhere. Nobody would hire me. Um, and, uh, and I just kind of felt like I was stuck going nowhere, you know? And that's when I came across podcasts and it was purely from a consumption standpoint. I was just listening all the time and I uh, thought it was a really cool way to consume uh, media and consume content. I liked the format. Um, I liked that it was audio. I liked that I could press play and then like clean my living room or do the dishes or mow the lawn and, and learn while I'm doing those things. I thought that was cool. And so uh, eventually it just kind of came to the point where I was like, Hey, maybe I should try this thing out as you know, podcasting seems like a cool way to make a living. Let's, see what that would look like. And uh, so just kind of started moving forward with it. And, you know, that was a few years ago, brings us kind of up to today. Wow. Wow. That is a, that's an awesome story. Uh, so you grew up in a well, very sheltered environment. I mean, to, you know, go to kindergarten, go to school and graduate and college and everything all in the same place with just several thousand people. I can, I can relate to that because I actually grew up in a town that has about 10,000 people and then I ended up in Las Vegas. Now, I want to really take this moment to compliment you because my trip to Vegas, you know, being a small town boy and then going to Vegas, I was uh, really blown away by how you could try to live all 24 hours. And, and I gave it my best shot. And uh, so I wound up coming home con air, you know, and uh, you, on the other hand, uh, have uh, at what point did you go to Vegas? Actually, Where, when was that? Yeah. So, uh, so we moved up to Fresno in 2014, moved back down to Lancaster in 20, 
17 um, after my wife's dad passed just because we didn't have a great base of friends or people that we knew up there. And so I was starting to travel a bunch and we wanted to just be around friends and family. So we moved back down to Lancaster, but we knew it was going to be a, a temporary thing. Um, and so probably eight, nine months after we moved back down to Lancaster, we moved out to Vegas. So we've been here for a little bit over three years now, um, January of 18, we moved here. That's awesome. That's awesome. From, uh, you know, that, that early life that you described, which was very sheltered to now, Mr. Vegas, boy, I can't wait for the people that are listening. If you get a chance to check this out on YouTube or just on one of our social media sites, you're going to love Travis's background and, uh, you know, I think when people picture you growing up, they're kind of picturing like this Amish community, right? You know, people are very sheltered and you're Mr. Vegas now. So, Travis, I think your original inspiration in podcasting was uh, John Lee Dumas, uh, Entrepreneur on Fire. Was that the original inspiration? Yeah, he, yeah, he was... Uh... He, he was the first one that offered any sort of continued education on what it meant to be a podcaster, really. You know, like I listened to several shows during that time period, but yeah, he was one of the ones that he, he, he had this like free podcasting course. And I was like, oh, I'll, I'll check that out. See, you know, see if I can make this thing happen somehow. And uh, ended up, ended up setting me on that path. Yeah. So good. You know, I believe that everybody needs a coach, which is why you're my coach, right? You know, when Cindy and I said, well, we're going to launch a podcast, we felt we were going to launch it before the pandemic. And then we felt more uh, now than ever. Uh, people really just need some words of inspiration, hope, and need to understand that people face challenges, but they get through those challenges and that there's good things on the other side and that we develop strength in our struggles. So you've talked about a couple of things. You not only talked about door-to-door -door sales, but you talked about making six figures in door-to-door -door sales. Now, door-to-door -door sales is tough, right? <laughs> you know, so let me not gloss over that. And then I want to know about, you know, your biggest challenges getting started in podcasting and just, uh, you know, being where you're at today with this. But door-to-door uh, -door sales, can we just talk about that for a second? Um, yeah, sure. What, what were you selling? So I started uh, selling solar in college, moved into selling alarms for a couple of years and then did water purification for a couple of years. Wow. And door to door sales. I mean, that is a, that is a challenging thing, right? You know, do you get a lot of doors closed in your face? All the time. Yeah. I mean, I mean, even if you're good, you know, like you still get doors slammed in your face. Yeah. It's just part of the, part of the gig, man, you know, just kind of, keep moving on and move on to the next, the next opportunity. You know, it, it definitely makes you definitely gives you that thick skin, you know, to just kind of like, just brush that one off and let's go find a different person. You know what I mean? That person wasn't a right fit. We'll find somebody who is, you know, well, there's a huge resiliency factor there. I mean, you're developing a strength there to even just say next. So many people yeah. get, you know, let's just use this as like a metaphor. Many people get doors closed in their face. And then they just say, that's it. That's yep. the end. They don't yep. look at the next door, you know? So I'm sure yeah. that you were able to, I, I know from reading some about you online that early on you were an entrepreneur as a kid, whether it be pulling the weeds and getting paid five bucks from your parents or whatever, you know, you were always you know, trying to have a little bit of a hustle uh, yeah. from a young age. So I think you have that entrepreneurial itch, but to combine that with determination and resiliency, uh, has led us to where we are today. So when you start getting this itch, you're like, you know, I like this podcasting thing. This is this is a great little uh, method for learning. It's something I think I want to do. Tell us about your journey to now you're mentoring others and you have a successful podcast in the top 25. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about maybe the greatest challenges that you had getting started in podcasting? Now you figured it out. Yeah, man. Uh, so podcasting was like a just a different challenge, you know, with, with door to door, it's, it's easy. I mean, it, it's simple and maybe not easy, you know, it's definitely not, not easy to your point, but it's very simple. It's very much just a numbers game. You yeah. know what I mean? What you lack in skill, you make up for in numbers. And that's, it's that simple. If you're not very good, you might have to hit a hundred doors to sell a deal. You know, if you're better, you might only have to hit 15 or 20 doors to sell a deal. Um, but ultimately, as soon as you come up with one sale, you know how many doors it took you to get that sale. So if you want to make another one, go knock on that many more doors and then do that again and then do that again. You know what I mean? So it's just such a simple equation with podcasting. It wasn't that way. 
uh, there's a lot of other factors that, uh, that, that, that you have to consider. And there's a lot of other, um, you know, fact, uh, like, the, like luck plays a factor in, in podcasting and, um, timing plays a big factor in, is a big factor in podcasting, um, you know, hitting the top charts or Apple's algorithm, or if you can become a guest on this show or that show, or how much credibility or authority you have, or if you have an existing audience somewhere else, or there's so many things that affect your ability to succeed as a podcaster. So it was a completely different can of worms for me. Um, and, uh, in, in really the, biggest obstacle was that I thought it was going to grow a lot faster than it did. I uh, thought, you know, every time I would do something that I was like, this is it, this is going to be the where we explode it just never happened. You know what I mean? Like it just, it just didn't happen. Wow. And so, um, that, that thick skin and that resiliency that you build doing door to door, I think came in really handy when I, when I started the podcast, because I just didn't realize it was going to take as long as it did to be able to get it off the ground and running. And now when I look back, it makes a lot of sense because I've been in the industry now for a while and I see all these other people and I've interviewed hundreds of people on our show and have had conversations with them about their beginning and their journey. And it's so true across the board for every content creator that I know. Uh, but for some reason we all get in our heads, it's going to be super easy. And then three months later, we're going to be competing with Joe Rogan and Conan O'Brien. And then we have 32 downloads and episodes still when you've been doing it for 11 months, you're like, man, this thing doesn't work or um, this isn't worth my time or whatever other excuses you start throwing in your head. But at the end of the day, man, it's just about that consistent work over a long period of time. That's what I was going to get from you right there was the consistency. In fact, when you're first talking about the door to door, I was thinking of Jim Rohn. I'm a Jim Rohn fan and Jim Rohn talked about those kind of sales. And he said, you know, a ratio will develop. Yeah. And right. so I may not be the best, but I know that I am the hardest working. Yep. And so if I need 10 sales and it's a hundred to one, you can count on the fact that I will talk to a thousand people. And so I was like, ah, okay, we got, we got a bit of a Jim Rohn philosophy going here. hundred percent, man. I listened to a bunch of Jim Rohn back in the day. Um, and yeah, he largely influenced a lot of my, especially early days, personal development stuff. Um, but yeah, he, yeah, don't wish it were easier, wish you were better, you know, and that mentality on the doors too was where he talks about, yeah, if you do something long enough, a ratio will appear, you know, and, and he goes into, uh, you know, if somebody can talk to 10 people and enroll one person, you know, I'll, I'll, or if someone can talk to 10 people and enroll nine people and I can talk to 10 people and enroll one pe one person, I'm going to enroll more people than that person's going to enroll because guess what? I'm going to go talk to a hundred people and enroll 10 of them. And that person's going to talk to 10 people and enroll nine of them. I I still win. You know what I mean? And that it's that, it's just, it's just that mentality that, that translates into every field that, that you enter. And there's a, a great podcast by Guy Raz called how I built this that NPR puts on. Um, it's one of the top podcasts in all of iTunes, um, especially in business category, but Guy Raz has had conversations with founders of these multi-billion dollar companies that are household names. And, um, he wrote a book recently called How I Built This, like a sister book, you know, to the podcast. Yeah. And when I heard Guy Raz be interviewed on, you know, he did a tour himself to promote his book. So I probably listened to four or five different interviews that he did uh, with people that I enjoy listening to. And they would ask him like, hey, what's the number one common denominator that you found between all these, you know, crazy successful uh, billionaire founders and entrepreneurs? And his answer on every single one of the interviews that I listened to. So this is how I know that he put some thought into this because it wasn't different every time. It wasn't random. He, he definitely put some thought into it. The number one common denominator that he said was the ability to handle rejection. That every one of those top level, high level entrepreneurs that made it to where they are, they all have the ability to get a no and blow past it and move on and find somebody to say yes. Yeah, they might take them 50 no's. It might take them a hundred no's. It might take them three no's. It might take them 300 no's, but they're going to find somebody to say yes eventually. Um, and he said that was like one of the, one of the uh, most important common denominators and markings of a successful entrepreneur in the long run. And so, you know, the more you can build up that muscle, the, the better you're off that you're going to be and the better you become every time you get rejected, man, every time you get rejected, it, it's a little bit, it's a little painful. Yeah. And so yeah. you ask yourself the question, well, how can I avoid that again? Yeah. And you get a little bit better. What went wrong in that conversation? Where did I lose them? What did I say that turned them off? Did I have my body 
positioned weird? Did I, was I using an aggressive tone? Uh, did I, did I scrunch my eyebrows way too much? Did I not do that enough? Did I not present like I cared? Did it, like what, what went wrong and how can I improve on that? Yeah. And then you take that into the next, the next, uh, conversation and then you get rejected again. Okay. Now I learned this and now I learned this. Let's take both of those and move into the next conversation. And now I learned these three things, you know? So like everybody uh, talks to a lot of people about rejection. They'll say something like, you know, you're, you're, you're in the same position, whether you ask or don't ask. Meaning that like, if you, if, if you're going to go in and ask for something, but you decide not to, you already don't have it. So you can't lose more by asking, right? If you ask, you're just in the same position that you were before you asked. Um, The only thing that asking does is present the opportunity to receive the thing that you wanted to get. Um, But I would argue that every time you ask, you benefit, even if they say no, because you're learning a little bit more on how to be, how to potentially turn that no into a yes, the next time that you have the conversation or are presented with that opportunity. So um, yeah, you got, got to, got to be willing to go for those things. Wow. This, This is an interesting, very interesting podcast because it seems like the key that really opened began to open up some doors for you besides the fact that you had a work ethic from a young age besides the fact that you had an entrepreneurial itch was the fact that you decided to open a book people would have fell off their chairs but then you're like you know what i'm going after this learning and i'm going after this learning with a person with a mindset that can handle rejection and i'm going after this learning with a mindset that is okay with being consistent even if i've been doing this for 11 months and I only got 42 downloads, I'm still going to persist through what appears to be rejection and get to the other side of that with the consistency that I'll continue to have. So, I mean, these are some really great lessons. I know that we're going to be coming close to our end here. So what do you think? I I think that people will want to reach out to you. Travis Chappell is our coach for podcasting, guys, you know, so I think that they'll want to reach out. What do you think are the most important things that people should do consistently if they want to put out a podcast or, you know, if you want to be more general, uh, certainly you can give other keys to success. Uh, sure. you know, what, was, what would that be? Yeah. I would say one thing to keep in mind that will maybe potentially help you stay consistent, even on the days where you don't feel like being consistent is this one statement that I heard a long time ago. I think it was actually back when I was knocking on doors still. And somebody told me um, uh, that if you want to live a life that nobody else can live, then you have to be willing to do the things that nobody else will do. And that rings true for me every time. Like when I, when my alarm goes off at 4am and I want to just go back to bed and lay down and shut my eyes. Like that's the statement that plays in my mind. It's just like, okay, that's fine. If you else, you know, but if you don't want to live like everybody else, then you got to do the things that other people aren't willing to do. And getting up at 4 a.m. to make sure that I get my gym time in before my kids get up and the day gets crazy, like that's something that I don't want to compromise on because that's a part of my life that I want to be able to have. And I want, like I said, I want to be able to live the life that nobody else can live because I'm willing to put in the work and do the things that nobody else is willing to do. Um, and uh, and a lot of times, a lot of times, those things that people aren't willing to do. It's because they're hard. Yeah. It's hard to, to get up early. It's hard to stay consistent. It's hard to do things even when you don't feel like doing them. It, like those things are hard to do. And that's why most people don't do them. And, and by the way, if you don't want a life that nobody else uh, can live, then that's fine. You know, do your <laughs> right. thing. You know what I'm saying? Like if you want to sleep, like I off, oftentimes I actually kind of envy um, that type of living where you just kind of like get up when you want and, and you go to work and you come home, you get to unplug, you get to just be with your family and be present and don't have to think about 20 other things that could potentially going on. Like I, I actually envy that in, in, in a lot of ways. Sure. Um, and I'm not saying that you have to believe the same way that I believe. I'm just saying that if you do want the things that you say that you want, but you're not willing to put in the work to get them, then don't be upset when they don't come. Yeah. Like you have nobody to blame but yourself. And that was a reality that I did, wasn't willing to face basically is like, if I get to the end of my life, I want to know that I've left it all on the table. And if I didn't figure it out and I didn't hit my goals and I didn't live my dream life, if, if that stuff didn't happen, then at least I'll be able to look at it and be like, but I, I tried my hardest. I gave it 110%. I left everything on the field. Um, because you know, I, I, I'll take, I'll take failure over regret any day of the week, you know? And so, um, I think that that's, that's something that, that 
you know, you have to sit down and ask yourself those questions and, and have the self-awareness to understand what you want out of life and then say, okay, if that's what I want, I got to be willing to put in the work to go get it. And consistency is going to be a part of the equation, no matter what it is. I promise you that. Yeah, that is so good. So good. We actually get up at 2.45 a.m. And I know some days I'm working until 9 p.m. Uh, we open our gyms. Our people want to work out at 4.15. As you know, <laughs> you like to work out at 4 a.m. yourself. And so we open up and we do it. And I've always taken a certain amount of pride in that. And not because there's anything special about the time, 2.45. There's something special about the willingness. I, I know that there are a lot of gyms that want to offer sessions at those mm-hmm. times. And Yep. And I'm like, you know, if we're willing to do what other people are not willing to do, it's going to take us to places that they can't go. And exactly. so yeah. uh, I really, not even where they don't want to go, but they literally can't get there because right. they didn't put in the work, you know, they, they, there's, that's the, that's the price of admission. You know what I mean? So um, that's, you gotta, you gotta decide how bad you want it. You know? So good. So good. Wow. This is uh, that's a real gem right there. So Travis, if people want to connect with you, follow you, uh, you know, the guestio thing is big as well. Uh, I mean, there's people that may be looking for, you know, speakers or guests for a podcast or whatnot. Can you just talk a little bit about the different ways that they can connect with the things that you're doing? Yeah. Guestio.com is a great place to find me, man. Um, I, and, and that's like our biggest project that we're working on right now. So I'd love for anybody listening to this to go check out Guestio and register for a free account, browse through some of the shows and guests that we have listed over there and uh, see if it can benefit you. Awesome. 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 Well, Travis, thank you so much for being a guest on the Overcomers podcast. You are definitely an overcomer, uh, overcoming everything, you know, whether it be the podcast, the door to door, just life in general, you know, thank you for being on here. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks for tuning in to the Overcomers Podcast, sponsored by Journey 333. When I am not hosting the Overcomers Podcast, I am working at one of our fitness franchises so that I can continue to help people overcome adversity on a daily basis. That's right. People come to the Journey 333 fitness franchises because they want a coach in their life. They want somebody to help them overcome the adversities of life, motivate them to higher levels of greatness, bring out their potential help them lose weight, get off medications, fight depression, fight anxiety. That's what we do on a regular basis. If you feel like you want your life to be about helping more people to overcome their adversities, if you feel like you're an overcomer and you want to create more overcomers, then maybe owning a Journey 333 franchise would be for you. To find out more, go to www.journeyfitness333.com.